so it's good to be in church tonight uh, with all of uh, my fellow believers. So I'm always glad to uh, not only go to church, but to have the good fellowship that uh, we can experience at church. So uh, if you would uh, follow along with me, we're going to do a little bit of reviewing tonight, and then uh, we're going to cover four chapters. So I've got about an hour and a half's worth of it. No, I'm teasing. It's not that long. But um, uh, this is a great part tonight. I get to uh, talk about the salvation experience. And as I think about, you know, my own salvation and, and some of, you know, as you read the book, you kind of get some of the feelings of, of what it, you remember what it was like to get saved and have all that conviction and the load of guilt on, you know, that you carry with you to have that forgiven. And so it's a glorious time in the book. You know, unfortunately, they go back into backsliding and so on. But uh, we're going to look tonight again at the war for man's soul. Uh, John Bunyan Classic here. So let's pray and we'll get started. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to meet here in church. And, Lord, it's always good to, uh, to have that encouragement, the fellowship of other believers. And, uh, Lord, help us uh, to not ever take that for granted, especially through the things that we've just gone through uh, with our, our country. I pray, God, that as a church we would never take this for granted. Please bless uh, the uh, meeting that we have here tonight. Bless the word that I'll read, the, the words of God from the Bible, as well as uh, this great book that we're reading through and studying through. And I pray that you'll bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, by way of review, chapter 7, Shaddai's army approaches, and uh, the chapter is about 40,000 soldiers coming in four divisions to Mansoul. And uh, I know that there's a number of you that know all four of these captains, Boanerges, Sons of Thunder, the, uh, the preacher is what that means, and so the, uh, the powerful orator in, in the book, the preacher, Captain Conviction uh, is there as well, Captain Judgment, whose middle name is Punishment, and Captain Execution, and so the uh, army of of God, of Shaddai, coming to man, and uh, that's in the picture of salvation, uh, the conviction that comes at the point right before salvation. It's interesting, we're going to look tonight at five more captains that also come, and you'll notice, I think, that the first four that came in the first wave, this was uh, Shaddai reaching out to man, and and early on in the, in the history of man, God reached out to man and he gave them the Old Testament. And that was the preachers, the, the Old Testament prophets. That was uh, the conviction and the judgment of the law and the captain execution. You know, if you, di if you disobeyed, if you broke certain laws, I mean, the punishment was death. So this first wave of captains is really, I think, a picture in the book of the Old Testament. And then when you get to the second wave of captains and the army coming down, God again reaches out to man. And this time he comes in the form of faith and love and so on. Much more so New Testament words and New Testament ideas. So that's chapter 7. Chapter 8, Captain Boanerges summons to Mansoul three times and con tries to convince them to return to Shaddai. And as everyone returns home to ponder their decision... The quietness of night. And again, we talked about that last week, how the conviction comes in the nighttime. And you lay your head on your pillow, and you face reality. Uh, you go out in front of people, and you can put on a false front and pretend. But the truth hits you when you lay your head down in the pillow at night. And I'm convinced that's why so many people do other things to try to help them forget all of that conviction. Chapter 9, Shaddai's forces repulsed. This assault on the ear gate was powerful. Mansoul was able to resist uh, this first wave of conviction that God gave to them was resisted and, and they were able to uh, put off this attack. They thought that they would enjoy, be able to go back to enjoying their freedoms. No restrictions. But of course, that wasn't the case. Their nights were even more miserable. And, of course, their conscience began to bother them as well. Uh, he couldn't be kept in a coma, and the thunderous voice 
of the conscience. And so they would do anything for peace of mind. And so they finally called for peace, a parley. And uh, the only answer really was unconditional surrender. And of course, that's what God wants in our salvation. There's only one thing he's looking for. You can't add anything to salvation. You just surrender, submit to him. And so this unconditional surrender, uh, a great uh, thought here, very important thought in the terms of peace. Uh, the Bible says that you'll find peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's it. It doesn't say anything else. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't come from man. It doesn't come from our actions. It doesn't come from baptism. Uh, I've seen people, heard of people wanting to get baptized over and over again and take the Lord's Supper, communion, to try to find peace. And all they need is one unconditional surrender at salvation. All right, chapter 10. The title's chapter is Emmanuel Enters the Fray. And so I'll summarize some, but I also want to bring out, I think, uh, great thoughts from Scripture that John Bunyan was obviously referencing. When Emmanuel came, the captains, the four captains who were already there, they heard the tidings of good news and were rejoicing. They heard the tidings of good news. And the rest of Mansoul pretty much didn't hear anything. They were too busy going about their pleasures and their own lusts to even notice. And I don't think John Bunyan put that, that, that used those words by accident. When Jesus came down to the earth the first time, you remember that the, the shepherds were given the announcement that there were tidings of great joy. These tidings were given to Mansoul, but most people didn't notice. At Jerusalem and Bethlehem, everybody went around about their business. Herod was there. I mean, everybody just continued as if everything was normal. Only a few people recognized the coming of Jesus Christ the first time. So this tidings of good news. There were five captains who came with Emmanuel this time. Shaddai had sent these first four, now these next five captains. And so there will be a total of nine. And of course, there's great significance with each one of these. The first one is Captain Faith. And he is accompanied by Mr. Promise. Faith and the promise of God go, of course, hand in hand. Romans chapter 4, verse number 20, the Bible says that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God and then it finishes the verse, but he was strong in faith. Listen, when we have the promises of God to hold on to, then our faith can be strong. And, of course, if you read your Bible, you know that the promises of God have been filled over and over and over again. Just the other night, <clears throat> I don't think it was, it last night even, uh, one of my children was reading the, the section where Josiah went in and and uh, burnt the bones of the priests. And of course, as you read that, if you know the, the backstory to that, you know that uh, those priests had been prophesied against about 300 years earlier. And the exact prophecy came to pass, Josiah by name. And so the, the promises of God that we've seen over and over in Scripture build our faith. Captain Faith, Captain Promise. Have you been... Uh, have you been saved? If you're saved, you're saved by the promise of God and your own faith in that promise. And so uh, what a wonderful thing, faith and the promise together. The next captain is Captain Good Hope and Mr. Expectation. I won't spend too much time on these. Philippians 1.20 says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. There, there are some things that we might be ashamed about because, you know, we think that we might be wrong. But the scriptures we're not ashamed about. And our final destiny we don't have to be ashamed about. We don't have to be ashamed that we're Christians and believers, even though the world can make fun of us uh, and mock us all they want. Uh, hope and expectation is our end uh, goal. Number three, Captain Love and Mr. Merciful. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 says... But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, 
wherewith he loved us. Boy, God's mercy and his love for me is, is seen throughout these passages that will be, or the, these, the book that we'll be looking at tonight, the chapters. Love and mercy, totally undeserved. And I know that in my life, I haven't deserved anything that God has given me. And all the goodness that he's given me has been in spite of me. Captain Guileless and Mr. Harmless. 1 Peter 2.22, talking about Christ, Peter says, of course, Peter knew a lot about Jesus. And he said about Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in uh, in his mouth. He said Jesus never had any sin in him, and Peter would know he spent over three years with Jesus. And uh, again, so Captain Patience and Mr. Suffer Long, long suffering. Colossians 1.11 says that we're strengthened with all might unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now, these five captains, they came up to the city of Mansoul, and they built these bulwarks around the city. Of theirs, of course, Mount Justice and Mount Gracious and Mount Harkin. And, and as I think about that, it's just salvation, different aspects of salvation over and over again. How many of you, without answering this out loud, how many of you knew all about salvation when you first got saved? Of course, none of us. But the more that you read your Bible and the older you get in the Lord, You study and learn more about salvation, and you find out that salvation includes all of these things. It's justice. It's the grace of God. It's the mercy of God. It's the love of God. It's the long-sufferingness, long-suffering of God. It's his goodness. All these things are accompanied to us in salvation. And so uh, that's one of my lessons I'll bring out in a second here, that We as Christians should always be learning more about our salvation. And just it should bring out that thankfulness in us for what we have been given. The promises and the truth that we've been given. So the people still didn't want to come to a decision, but they knew they must. Finally, Diabolus answered, quietly tried to convince Shaddai that Mansoul had chosen him instead. I've conquered them, he said. And Emmanuel puts uh, Diabolus in his place. I I love the fact that God has authority, absolute authority over Satan. You see that in numerous places in the Bible, in the story of Job. God said, I don't want you to to, to touch him in this area. And the devil listened. Um, When Jesus was traveling, uh, of course, the maniac of Gadara and others... The, the demons that he met, they listened to Jesus. They knew who he was, and of course they trembled, but they were afraid of him. And the authority of God and of Jesus Christ, his son, is clearly evident over Satan. So why should we give, right? Why should we listen to the devil when we can claim the power of God in fighting against the devil? Mansoul belongs to Emmanuel. Emmanuel claimed because of two things. He said, first of all, Mansoul is mine because it's my inheritance from my father. The father gave us to Jesus Christ. We, Mansoul, we are the inheritance of Christ. The Bible says in, of course, John 3, 16 and other places that he's the firstborn. He's the first one in authority. It doesn't mean he was literally physically born. He's the, uh, the ultimate authority in uh, the line from God. He, we are his inheritance, and he counts us as heirs of God. So it's an amazing thing. That's, uh, sorry, Jesus, Emmanuel, recognizing that we belong to him, because, to, his, to him because his father gave it to him. And then secondly, we also belong to Emmanuel because he bought us and paid for us. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We have been redeemed. We've been bought. If you're saved here tonight, you don't belong to yourself. You belong to God. Ephesians 1, 14, talking about the Holy Spirit. He's the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. We've been bought. We're the purchased possession. We've not been fully redeemed yet. 
One day when we get to heaven, Ephesians 4.30, we'll be redeemed at that time. But until then, the Holy Spirit is here and we belong to Christ. Man's soul was not their own. And, and isn't it amazing that Jesus would stand up to Satan to claim us? Right? He's not, he, he's not getting anything much, you know. Uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. So he's not getting anything, but yet he's fighting for us and claiming us as his purchased possession. Man's soul belongs to Emmanuel. Some lessons quickly from chapter 10. We should try to understand the greatness of our salvation Read about your salvation. Read about the grace of God and the love of God, justification by faith. And we could go on and on. All the different aspects, of course, many of them found in the book of Romans. God also has complete power and authority over Satan. And if he does, he doesn't intend for us to be under the authority of Satan. The devil's here. He's the prince of this world. So he's using this world to try to sidetrack, to distract us. But we shouldn't be living a life that is after him. We're not to walk in darkness. Darkness is a picture of Satan. We're to walk after the light. We're to walk uh, after the Lord. Uh, Romans chapter 8, I think of, we're to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. God has complete power and authority over Satan. And then, of course, thirdly, we belong to Christ. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, uh, the good song says. We belong to Christ. Chapter 10, chapter 11 then, negotiations. <clears throat> All right, let me see where I am. Yes, the book. I got to quote this part. It's great. The, the chapter starts out, liar, liar, Liar! And finally, his underlings say, what are you, who, are you, who are you calling a liar? And he says, no, Diablo says, no, I'm looking for a liar. And they said, oh, you're the best liar in the whole universe. Oh, yes, I lost track of where I was. Uh, he is the father of all lies. And so we have to be careful. Young people, you have to especially be careful. You don't have the advantage of experience and you don't have the advantage of maturity necessarily to realize that the devil's lies look good. They look good. But they're not real. They're false. And when Satan is defeated here in this chapter, the, the Mansulians find out what Satan really is. He's a scrawny, skinny. And without his armor, there isn't much to him. And, and so don't believe the lies of Satan. And so you, those of us who are older, we've got to use our experiences that we've had and, and our lessons and our understanding of the scriptures to warn these young people of the lies of Satan, and he's going to try to lead them astray. Diabolus tried to negotiate, finally, a proposition with Emmanuel. <clears throat> See here, Diabolus knew that he had one small, what he thought was an upper hand against Emmanuel. You know what it was? Man had a free will. He said, I'm going to twist his will to go against God. And so he thought he still had the upper hand. And so he just decided to negotiate some propositions. I tried to erase these out of here. Let me give you these real quickly and I'll, I'll move. Uh, the offer of Diabolus and the answer of Emmanuel each time. He said, I'll deliver up half of Mansoul to Emmanuel. And uh, Emmanuel said, the whole town is mine. I want the whole thing. And Diablo said, you can have the title of Lord of all of Mansoul, but not the duties associated with the job. This reminds you of Jesus on the temptation when uh, Satan tried to get him to give him allegiance in exchange for the world. And, of course, Jesus gladly didn't take it. I'll have, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll have all of it or none at all, uh, Emmanuel said. Uh, Diablo said, will you assign to Diablos a private place to live? All I need is a little back room somewhere and of course Jesus wouldn't give that up uh, either I'll lose nothing of that finally Diablos says okay everything is yours just let Diablos be entertained as a wayfaring man oh here it is the wayfaring man who wandered in the time of David and almost ruined David's life 
everything fell apart for the family of David because of that wayfaring man. Of course, Jesus wasn't going to go for that. Okay, everything is yours. Let the Diabolonians, sounds like baloney, come into the town. Let them just come into town and trade sometimes. And of course, Jesus says, love not the world. I don't want anything to do with the things of this world. Finally, he just said, can he send letters and postcards and tokens of his love? And of course, no, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So here we see these negotiations <clears throat> between Diabolus and Emmanuel. And Jesus didn't go for those temptations. He showed us how to resist temptation, didn't he? Matthew chapter 4 uh, chapter 3 and 4, uh, 3, I think it is, where Jesus resisted the temptations. And he shows us the same thing. In Hebrews chapter 4, we have the strength of the Lord to give us victory over temptation. Several lessons. Satan uses our free will against us. He uses our free will. He tries to get us to like certain things. As I think about my will and what I like, there are certain kinds of food that I have learned to like. That if you heard what I eat in certain things, you'd say it's gross or you wouldn't like it. But that's okay because I like it. Anyway, my coffee soup. So, anyway, some, I've told a couple people about that and they think it's the grossest thing in the world. Don't, don't care. I like it. It tastes great. Um, so my will, the things I like determine what I'm going to do. And I'm so glad over these years of being saved, God has given me good things that I hold dear, right? He's given me things that I like that are good and right and holy and precious, whereas other people think that that's absolutely nuts to give your life for the Lord and you don't get to drink and you don't get to womanize and you don't get, they, they got it all wrong. Their will is messed up and, and watch out, Satan will use your free will against you. Satan also will do his best to gain a foothold in your life. And, of course, God doesn't negotiate with Satan. When God's authority comes down, uh, it's final, and I love that. The Bible says God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's what we do. We worship God in truth, and we don't negotiate with Satan either. Number 12, chapter 12. Here's the chapter on salvation. This chapter deals with the salvation experience that takes place in the heart of the believer. The cries and the uh, blastings of war begin. All shed eyes, captains, and their men wage war against the ear gate. Captain Boasting, Captain Secure, and Captain Bragman are all slain. Listen, when I got saved... All of my bragging, I have nothing to brag about. Ephesians chapter 2, of course, verses 8 and 9 tell us we have nothing to, to brag about. If it's by works, then we have something to boast in. But we have nothing to boast in. It doesn't matter if you're saved at four years old and you've never drank or done smoke, any of the wrong vices that we talk about. If you're four or five years old, and, you know, a young child gets saved and puts their trust in the Lord. They have nothing to brag about. They're little sinners just like everybody else. If somebody has lived a life of wicked sin till they're 85 years old and then get saved, they, of course, have nothing to brag about either. Listen, Mr. Bragman is not around at the point of salvation. Uh, God makes sure of that. <clears throat> Finally, Diabolus makes a final last-ditch stand. Draw off your forces. I'll bend man's soul to your bow. Make me your deputy, he says to Emmanuel. I'll persuade them to be religious. No, I'll make them reform. I'll set up and maintain a ministry. I'll do it twice a week. I will serve you if you'll just let us be. I can't help but think that that's so true all around the world. Christianity, full of dead churches and dead, but not, not believers, dead in Christ, people who are, are not saved, and the devil has continued to manipulate them. Isn't that something? The devil's convinced them that they're in religion. It's all a form of godliness, but absolutely no power, no life whatsoever. 
Finally, uh, Emmanuel says, whoa, that's enough. Deceit was your first card, and deceit is your last card. And Diabolus in the book says, okay, yeah, you're right. We understand each other. I'm full of deceit. That's my, that's my final straw. <laughs> Diabolus conceded defeat and made a mad dash for the castle. The captains made their way to the castle, and they defeat Diabolus, and they strip him of all his armor. And in the book, he's brought out into the town square, and he's humiliated, and he's exposed for who he really is. And man was so ashamed that they had been tricked, deceived by, by Satan. Isn't that true? When we get saved, we realize how much of a sinner we are, and we can't believe that we were fooled by all of this, that Satan could have such a rule and a reign over our lives. And Diabolus is exiled. Finally, a petition is brought forth. <clears throat> Everybody awake? I know the lights are still down. I got to stop. No more jokes like I did last week, but I need everybody to wake up again because I'm tired, huh? So if I'm tired, I know you're tired. So let's uh, try to finish this off. A petition is drawn up and sent at the hand of Mr. Desires Awake to Emmanuel asking for mercy. They decide to quickly send a second petition along with Mr. Wet Eyes. All right, so these two are going to take a petition to Emmanuel, who had hauled off the devil, and he was now outside the city. And they were expecting judgment because of their rebellion against the Lord. And so these two take it out. Now, who, who are they? Desires awake. He was desiring to wake up to the truth. He was wanting truth. He's not saved yet. Mansoul is not saved yet. But his conscience has been stirring, and he's been awakened to the truth. Mr. Wet Eyes is a man of weeping. Weeping. Listen, I, I think we mock, and we don't think uh, that, pe a lot of times, we don't think that people should weep. But certainly we should weep and sorrow over our sin. The Apostle Paul often talks about weeping. Um, in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10, he talks about the repentance that's godly. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. And this is a great example here of the weeping over sin, the weeping over their rebellion. They knew their own wicked state, and they're asking for mercy. Emmanuel reminded them of their great rebellion against Shaddai, Here's some of the things they had done. They had sided with a liar and a murderer against God, against Shaddai. Their resistance to the armies of Shaddai, they'd resisted God's uh, conviction and judgment and execution. They resisted those captains. And then, of course, their great sinfulness, living in the lusts of their own flesh and wicked sin. And, and Emmanuel confronted them with that. You know, what, what we need to understand in salvation is that we have to confess our sins. We have to name our sins. We have to know what we've done wrong. We have to be aware of our wicked sin. Uh, and then the frightful part of the message from Emmanuel. He said, you go back and you tell conscience and mere understanding and will be will. I want them back here tomorrow. And when they go back to town, they said, oh, great, it's over. He's going to come in and wipe us out. He was angry. He saw our sin. He confronted us with our rebellion. He said, it's over. And they were all convinced that, that this was going to be the end. Finally, the next day, they make their way out to uh, Emmanuel. And he confronts them. He said, you've suffered yourselves to be corrupted in Diabolus. And they said, yes. We chose Diabolus over you. You've been content to live in tyranny. They said, yes, for his ways were pleasing to our flesh. We liked the sin. We, we were consumed with our own lusts. You did not want me to get the victory over you. No, we did not. What punishment do you think you deserve at my hand? 
And of course, the punishment, Romans 6, 23, for sin is death. And they said, death, Lord. Because I have shed my blood for your sin, I have authority, he said, for my father to pardon you. So I pardon you fully and completely. Wow. We have a full, complete pardon. Even in spite of our rebellion, in spite of our joining forces with the other side, we become one of Satan's children in John chapter 8, where our father is the devil, and yet he has mercy and full pardon. Boy, I can't believe that the Lord would save me. You know, I, I knew I was a sinner. I knew all the wicked things I did as a little kid. I was a young person when I got saved. But I knew all the wicked things I'd done. I didn't deserve anything. And yet he gave me a complete pardon. Emmanuel hugged them and kissed them and robed them, gave them a parchment declaring his love for them. And they came back to the town of Mansell and they spread the great news that Mansell was saved and everybody threw uh, a huge party and excited. Everybody was so thrilled at the fact that they had been pardoned completely. Emmanuel's reception in Mansell, chapter 13. What a glorious day. Do you remember what it was like when you first got saved? Uh, those of you who were saved a little bit later in life, you know, as an adult especially, you, you probably are much more familiar, it's much more obvious and, and uh, something you'll never forget, how you felt that day when your sins were forgiven. And, uh, you know, as a young person, I don't, you know, of course I'm, I'm thankful I was saved, but I wasn't saved out of a wicked life. I wasn't saved out of uh, a long life of rejecting God. It had been only a few years. My dad, on the other hand, of course, was saved at 38 years old had a full family, and, and uh, had lived many years already thinking that his works were going to get him to heaven, little knowing that those very works he thought were good were despised in the eyes of God. Think about that. The salvation, I'm sorry, the, the baptism into the church. God wasn't recognizing that. The, the taking of the, of the communion and the Lord's Supper, all of those acts were simply to make himself look good rather than to make you know rather than to remember the Lord and to lift him up and I'm not saying it was that very act was in total rebellion they did what they were told and so on but the truth is all of our good works are nothing in the eyes of God be thankful that the Lord save you there was great shouting in the streets Emmanuel moved to Mansoul and took the city over. When he got there, he fortified the city and built up some weapons and defensive works. Let me give you several of these. They built up the weapon to throw stones at the mouth gate called intercessor. Boy, they attacked the mouth gate with the intercessor. Listen, we need to use our mouth not in a well of bitterness, not in a uh, fountain of bitterness. We need to use our mouth for the Lord. Praying, soul winning, using our mouth to encourage other fellow believers. Yeah, the intercessor, the idea of prayer. They also tore down the seal of Diabolus and put up the seal of Shaddai and Emmanuel. Listen, our, in, at our salvation, this, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. We have a new seal. The book of Revelations talks about that new seal that's on the forehead of the believer. That, that seal is a, is a sign of ownership, of possession. And when Diabolus' seal was in Mansoul, it was a clear sign that they were owned and controlled by the devil. And Jesus now takes us over and, and controls us. And then he also built three strongholds. I'm sorry, he tore down three strongholds. The hold of defiance. You know, Defiance in a person is of the devil. Young person, defiance is of the devil. Um, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. What's witchcraft? Worshiping the devil. So 
defiance is devilish, and we've got to make sure that we deal with that in our children and in our own lives. They tore down defiance. They uh, tore down the midnight hold. They tore down the sweet sin hold. You know, when you first get saved, you've got to deal with some things in your life. I don't care how long, how old you are, what kind of sin you've done before you were saved. You've got to deal with things in your life. And uh, they were torn down. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Even new officers were set up. Understanding was made mayor again near the eye gate. Mr. Knowledge was promoted over Mr. Conscience, and we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. Will be well would guard the gates, the walls. And so when Jesus takes your life over, he sets up his throne, his plan, his direction. Does Jesus have control of your life? Has he built up his fortifications in your life? Has he put up his officers? You know, I don't know. A lot of people talk about, well, when you get saved, you're just repenting of your unbelief. That's absolutely not true. The Bible talks about repenting of sin. You're giving the Lord control of your life. And that's what happens to Mansoul here. Several lessons real quickly. Everyone should put work into building up their defensive works. Everyone. When you get saved, that's your new job. Building up things for the Lord. The Bible talks about, in a lot, number of places, Paul often talked about being built up. A house in the Lord, built up, and that's what we have to work at in our lives. Secondly, rely on the Lord for strength to shape your will to serve the Lord. Rely on Him. It was, will be will was controlled by, or not controlled, but he was helped by Shaddai to, to give him the opportunity, the, the, the strength to resist all the things that were going on in town. And in our lives, we have to do the same. We have to rely on the Lord. We have to continue to rely on the Lord. Every day, the Bible says, crucify yourselves. Galatians 2.20. <clears throat> so what are we doing to build up our lives after our salvation? Have you given your life completely to the Lord in this way? He wants to. He deserves it. He loves us in spite of us. And we need to surrender our city to him our house, our, our body. The War for Man's Soul, chapters 10 through 13. So I appreciate uh, your attention. A great uh, book here. If you haven't read it, uh, please do so. You'll help yourself follow along. And just so many little things to apply as you read through the book. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you, God, for uh, our salvation. Lord, help us not to be afraid to trust you. Lord, it was kind of natural. The Mansolians were living in the here and now. They lived in the flesh. They lived in the world. And, Lord, they just got to living as carnal, living in their own world. And I pray that we wouldn't do that. Lord, help us to realize that we can trust you with our lives. We trust you with our salvation. Help us in all our lives to give them to you. Thank you, God, for uh, the time that we've had tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.